Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture on coal for AP Environmental Science. Um, here are the learning objectives for this PowerPoint. So we're at two topics, um, 6.3 and 6.5. They both have the same enduring understanding, um, and it's going to be the same one throughout most of this, that humans use energy from a variety of sources, resulting in both positive and negative consequences. What we're going to focus on today is, uh, like I said, coal. So we're going to look at the three types of coal that we use for heat. We're actually not really going to talk about um, this bottom one as much, especially cogeneration today. It's on a different PowerPoint. I took it out of this one. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we're going to be looking at the combustion of fossil fuels, what that chemical process is, and what it releases, notably carbon dioxide. Um, energy for fossil fuels is produced by burning these fuels to um, generate heat, which turns water into steam. That steam turns a turbine, which generates electricity. So you guys are going to get tired of me saying essentially that same process again and again, that you boil water, which makes steam, which turns a turbine, which creates electricity. Okay. Um, we've already talked about how we mine coal, so we're not really going to talk about this too much, um, but you guys should know that coal is mined, um, either surface or subsurface mining, um, notably mountaintop removal mining or strip mining, even open pit mining. Um, and then we're not going to talk about fracturing today because that's really uh, just for oil uh, and natural gas. Here's the vocab. You can pause it and uh, write this down or get it later. So coal is one of our three fossil fuels. The three fossil fuels are coal, oil, and natural gas. Coal is the solid member of the three. It is a sedimentary rock, so it is solid. Um, and it is the remains of dead plants that first compact down into peat, and then by the heat and pressure of the earth, and then with geologic time, the impurities are squeezed out, and we get a more carbon-rich rock that we call coal. There are different grades of coal, like we'll, um, we're going to talk about that on the next slide, but where does that where do those plants come from? Well, the largest stores of um, coal were laid down during the Carboniferous period, and you note that the root word in there is carbon, um, due to the large amount of coal from this period. So it's named after the coal. And this is just after some of the first trees evolved. So they, um, the first trees evolved during the Devonian, but by this time, um, during the Carboniferous, trees really came into their own. The earth was much warmer than it is today, and much of the earth's surface was um, covered in swampy forests. And these um, trees, like Lepidodendron, um, these scale trees, were really, really fast-growing trees. They would um, reach tens of meters high, really, really quickly draw down lots of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and then they would um, incorporate it into their biomass and then die, and then they would fall down into the um, still anoxic waters of the swamps where they wouldn't really decompose very much at all. Fungi that could process lignin, which is one of the woody materials in plants, hadn't evolved yet. So they were really decomposing very slow, especially because, um, again, those fungi hadn't evolved and it was anoxic, very still waters. So all of those trees over millions and millions of years um, formed these really deep layers of organic material at the bottom of these swamps, and it eventually compacted down into, uh, again, first peat and then coal. Maybe not true peat because peat is coming from peat bogs, but similar enough. Um, so it compacts down into coal, and then that carbon that is that was taken out of the atmosphere during the Carboniferous has been locked in the Earth's crust and the geology of the Earth for hundreds of millions of years. You know, some coal deposits are tens of millions of years, but regardless, that carbon, whether it's from the Carboniferous period or any other period afterwards, um, that carbon has, those atoms of carbon have not been in atmospheric circulation for millions of years, meaning that they have not been acting as a greenhouse gas in the form of carbon dioxide for millions of years. They've been locked down in geology. So what do we do? We mine coal, we um, dig it up, we burn it, and whenever you burn something, you are going to be releasing carbon dioxide, or at least whenever you were doing combustion proper, you're going to be doing uh, releasing carbon dioxide. So on this chemical equation, this is our fuel, and we are going to be burning our coal in the presence of oxygen, and it's going to create water, which we don't really care about too much, um, but the carbon dioxide is the crucial one. Okay, this carbon dioxide is going to be released directly in the atmosphere, where it can be, um, where it is going to be uh, contributing to uh, global climate change, global warming, because it is a greenhouse gas. 
So let's get back to how coal is formed. Um, coal is going to go through these stages where you have these dead plant matter and wetlands um, and bogs and swamps. It could be the scale trees of the Carboniferous period. It could be peat that is starting to form today from peat moss and peat bogs. But regardless, um, it's going to go through these stages of first peat and then lignite, then bituminous, and then anthracite. Okay, um, these arrows here, they represent carbon purity. So you get from maybe 45% carbon to 65% carbon to 75% carbon to 90% carbon. Um, it also represents time, heat, and pressure. Okay, so these plants are going to um, live their lives in these bogs, then they're going to die, and then they're going to partially decay aerobically at the surface. They may not de decay really at all if they get buried um, really quickly. <clears throat> But as that plant matter becomes um, buried in these acidic soils, so either by more organic matter or by sediment, even by water, um, anaerobic decomposition is going to begin. But it's going to be really, really, really slow because these are acidic waters that have no oxygen. <clears throat> anaerobic, and anaerobic decomposition is much less efficient than aerobic decomposition. So it goes a lot less uh, quickly. It goes very, very slowly. And this compaction is going to form peat. So that's our first stage in this process, or the first uh, product that we get is peat. We can dig peat up, we can dry it out, and we can burn it, like we talked about in the biomass lecture. And people do that, right? Especially in places like Northern Europe. Um, but as we keep going through the sedimentation, the sediment um, continues to get buried by more and more layers on top of it, and it. Um, is therefore got more mass on top of it and it's going to get compacted down it's going to get squeezed um, down and all of the water the hydrogen other impurities like some nitrates are going to get squeezed out of it and the carbon purity is going to increase and with increasing pressure and heat more impurities are going to be um, squeezed out of that and it's going to create first um, lignite and then bituminous and then anthracitic coal okay this process is going to take millions or tens of millions or even a hundred million years to do, but eventually you are going to get into your higher grades of coal. And again, these arrows represent time. So your anthracitic coals are the high, are, sorry, the, are the oldest coals in general. Okay, exceptions do exist. But in general, anthracite is going to be older than bituminous, which is going to be older than lignite, which is going to be older than peat. Anthracite is going to experience um, greater heat and pressure under the earth and is therefore going to um, be a higher grade of carbon than um, lignite or bituminous. Okay, uh, you guys don't really need to know these percentages, but I just wanted to put them down here just to show the carbon purity. And what I want you to think about whenever we talk about carbon purity is when you combust this. If you are combusting 95% um, a rock that is 95% carbon, it's going to burn cleaner than if it's um, something like 65% carbon. If it's 65% carbon, it has other things in there. It has sulfur impurities like sulfates. It might have um, some nitrogen impurities. It might have other um, minerals that, that leached into that or that uh, dissolved into that rock or however, whatever the right term is. And when you burn that, it might be releasing some arsenic or some lead into the atmosphere, some mercury. Okay, but if you're burning a higher grade of carbon, if you're burning something that is more pure, it's primarily going to be water and carbon dioxide that you're releasing. But if you burn something that is only 55% carbon, you're going to be re uh, releasing a lot of sulfates, a lot of um, mercury, a lot of arsenic, etc. And those things that you're releasing, the mercury and the arsenic, is, are going into the atmosphere. So it's going into the atmosphere with the carbon dioxide. Um, I'm not going to read this to you if you want to pause this right now and um, and read it. I really like it. It's talking about how um, these uh, peat mosses uh, grow and how peat can start to be formed and then how quickly we can um, take this geologic process that takes centuries and centuries, tens of thousands of years, um, and how quickly we can destroy it, how quickly we can uh, dig it up and then burn it. And I want you guys to look down here at the bottom right. Notice the size of the shovel. That is a, you know, probably three, three and a half foot shovel. Um, so this is a really deep deposit of peat. And what I want you to notice is the color change as you go through it. Down at, or sorry, let's start at the top. At the top, it's um, very recent organic matter. It's 
very much a brown color. And then as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, most of those impurities are getting um, squeezed out of it. They're getting exhumed out of it. And the peat is compacting and compacting and compacting down. It's still peat down at the bottom. We're not into um, even our lignite, I, I don't think, yet. Um, but you notice how much darker it is. And that darker color represents higher carbon purity. And this is an example of peat that was uh, that was mined out. So um, again, you can go into a peat bog, you can partially drain it, you can um, then dig out the, these sections of peat and you let them dry in the sun and then you can burn them. Okay, people have been doing this for tens of thousands of years in Northern Europe and other places around the world. And when we were low population sizes and only doing it you know, a little bit, it didn't really matter you know, probably had some impact, but now that it's become an industrial operation, definitely in higher population sizes, definitely more of an impact. Okay, if we were doing this in class, I would have you guys do a think pair share, but since uh, this is a video, I'm just gonna put this up here. Um, again, clean or cleaner does not mean that no carbon dioxide is being released. It just means that you're not releasing other compounds. You're not releasing as much soot, less particulate matter. You're not releasing as many um, nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxide, maybe the lead, maybe the mercury that I mentioned, et cetera. Okay, but it doesn't mean that no CO2 is being released. It just means that other impurities are not being released into the atmosphere as much. All right, so most of the time we're going to combust coal directly at a power plant. Um, I'll talk about those power plants in a second. I'll show you a diagram and walk through a schematic. Um, but we can make some other products. The first one is through coal gasification where we are going to be making methane. That methane can then be combusted at a natural gas burning power plant or in industry, or it can be um, you know, used at stoves at home, any, anything that we use methane for. They call it syngas. This syngas is very, um, is still methane. It's it's very similar to the syngas that we talked about with uh, biofuels. So when we're talking about um, bio um, um, biogas, they call it syngas sometimes, but that's a product of fermentation. It's a product of um, anaerobic decomposition, and it is renewable because those energy sources that we're getting it from or the, that biomass that we're getting it from is very recent carbon, and it might be like corn that you're growing or, um, or animal waste or compost. They call this same gas also, even though it's derived from fossil fuels, a non-renewable resource. So I'm going to avoid the word same gas. I'm just going to call it methane, okay? Because that's what we're really getting, and that's what the chemical formula is or the chemical name. So that's what I'm going to call it. So we get this methane, and we can combust it as a cleaner energy source in a methane power plant or a natural gas power plant. We're also going to produce other products. Um, most notably carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, they can hopefully be sequestered. Um, they can be captured and sequestered a little bit easier in this process than if you just have a coal burning power plant that's releasing them. Okay, so we still make um, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. And in fact, because we're making these products, not all of the carbon is in this coal is going to be in the form of methane. A lot of it is going to be released as carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, so it can be a little bit um, inefficient. We're going to make hydrogen gas. That hydrogen gas can be used for a variety of things, um, po possibly hydrogen fuel cells, and then we're not going to really worry about the water. Okay. Um, so this can be a cleaner alternative than just popping the coal in a furnace and um, you know, using, uh, combusting it directly. The other product is Coke. So Coke is a um, coal product. Um, basically what you do is heat up coal in a anoxic environment where there's no oxygen. It removes a lot of the impurities. It evaporates off any of the water. It evaporates off um, a lot of the hyd um, free hydrogens. It uh, removes a lot of um, you know, the nitrates, the sulfates, etc. all the volatile organic compounds, they basically just get evaporated off. And then you're left with this really, really, really high carbon purity Coke that you can use um, for industry, primarily industry, um, especially like st uh, steel smelting um, because it burns hotter than coal even does. Okay. All right. So most of the time when we think about coal, we're thinking about producing electricity, a coal burning power plant, um, 
but we can use coal and other things, especially in manufacturing, especially when we're making steel, iron, or glass. That's because it burns hotter than most of the other resources. Now, some of these plants, especially for glass, are moving towards um, combusting uh, natural gas as a fuel source, but uh, coal is the traditional and the um, still most often used uh, fuel source. We can often use it in domestic heating. This doesn't happen as much in developed countries, but it still happens a little bit in developing countries where coal is readily available. It happened a lot in developed um, countries uh, in the past, though. So like in the U.S., old houses might have a coal chute. In, um, in the U.K., it's very common that old houses uh, would have a coal chute, and that's basically where you would take coal from the outside, shovel it down this, uh, this, this slide or this chute down into the basement where you'd get a pile of coal or like a little bin of coal, and then you can bur uh, burn it in your furnace all winter long. So it used to be much more common than it is today, but today it's primarily for electricity and um, manufacturing. All right, so here is a generic uh, diagram of a coal power plant. Um, so on the left, starting on the left, we have a pile of coal outside the power plant, and that coal is going to be pulverized. It's going to be crushed down uh, so that it has a higher surface area so that it burns hotter and faster. And it's going to go into the furnace via a conveyor belt. That furnace or that boiler is going to have these pipes with water in it, and those pipes with water are going to heat up and that water is going to boil. And as you guys know that um, when water boils, it turns to a gas and that gas occupies a greater volume than the liquid water does. <clears throat> so that gas is going to have high pressure and it's going to want to escape in the only direction possible. And that high pressure, very fast moving gas is going to move past this turbine in the only direction that it can. And as it does so, the kinetic energy of that moving gas, that moving water vapor or steam is going to uh, turn this turbine. The turbine is going to spin because of that and it's hooked to a generator. That generator is therefore going to be powered by the turbine and it's going to create electricity. The water can go to a variety of places after this. It can go to a condenser, like in this diagram. The condenser is basically like you take cold water from the river and you run it through all these copper coils, and these copper coils surround the hot water, the pipe of hot water um, from the uh, from the boiler that was, you know. Starting to condense down to steam, and it's going to um, cool that water enough so that it can be. Uh, turn back into liquid and then go back into the boiler. Okay, so we can use the cool water from the river to remove some of the thermal energy from that um, from that uh, that hot steam and condense it back down to be returned. Alternatively, it can go to a cooling pond or cooling towers where it can just sit there um, under you know and and cool with the ambient temperature of the of whatever it is outside and then it can be reused so then brought back into the boiler once it's a liquid or it can be dumped directly in the river that is the worst case scenario because then you're um, putting near boiling water right into the river or the lake or the bay or the ocean or wherever you're at that causes thermal pollution which we'll talk about on another day so that's kind of the worst case scenario, but um, usually it's going to be a condenser or cooling ponds or cooling towers. All right, so where is most of the coal on the planet? Um, so the distribution of coal is very much tied to where it is used. So in the United States, we have large coal reserves. So we were able to go through um, you know, the industrial revolution and industrialize very quickly because we had all of these coal reserves that we could use for electricity or for industry. Same thing with Northern Europe. Um, you see smaller coal reserves than the United States, but still. Um, Russia has huge coal reserves, same with Central Europe. China has large coal reserves. India has large coal reserves. Australia does. You don't see much coal in, as much coal in South America or um, Africa, which is why you typically don't see coal burning power plants um, in those regions, except in South Africa or where that coal is shipped in, such as all the way down from Russia to um, Africa or South America. Okay, but coal um, distribution is largely tied is largely tied to where coal is used. All right, um, let's look at uh, the amount of coal that we are using. So in 2013, I do want to point out first off that um, we're probably you know around right here ish. Um, 
So everything beyond this is projections. In 2013, we hit what is called peak coal. That is where we used the most coal um, ever, but then after that, it started to decrease. Okay, so in my mind, like what I'm thinking is that we're gonna see a continuing decrease in coal use, but we might see a resurgence um, based off of this model, based off of this study. Okay. Um, China, you can see, is the largest coal user on the planet right now and has been for quite some time. Um, the U.S. has been phasing out coal, but we still heavily rely on coal for electricity. You see that we're pretty much constant with this dark color um, in here. So pretty much constant use um, through the 80s into today. But we are starting to phase it out. Um, India is growing coal use. Okay, but you just see some of the uh, rest of the world as well. All right, a little bit about coal pollution. So we're gonna start with aquatic and terrestrial. The big one is acid mine drainage. So coal is often associated with sulfur containing rocks, especially sulfides or sulfates um, or sulfites, any of those. So for example, iron two sulfide, which is fool's gold. You guys probably know that one. So that's the one that I put here and it's one of the most common. Um, when water contacts some of these rocks, it can um, react with the rocks and produce sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid can drain um, into groundwater, it can drain into surface water, and it can contaminate those water sources, which is what we're seeing in this diagram on the bottom and the uh, picture on the top. So let's say that we have a coal, um, like a coal mine, and water seeps from all the rock above that coal mine, so the mountain above that coal mine, into the coal mine, and then it pools, it, con it, it congregates, maybe it seeps down into, um, into groundwater, or maybe it can't, maybe it's impermeable rock below it, and it just continues to pool, continues to grow and grow and grow, until eventually it reaches the um, mouth of the mine, where it can start to leak out, and it's gonna leak out all of this um, nasty copperish looking water, which is um, containing all of the acids. Okay. Um, it can alternatively come from coal piles. So coal is often piled up. We see in this case, we got um, waste rock pile. So the waste rock, the um, coal that is piled or the coal that is uh, being washed because coal is usually washed before it's combusted to remove a lot of the uh, dirt and stuff like that that's on it. It could be coming from tailing piles or, ta um, yeah, tailing piles. We usually don't see tailing ponds with coal, but tailing piles, um, which is what this waste rock pile could be, or abandoned mines. Um, we, a lot of this could be um, not just containing the acids, but also containing heavy metals that are dissolved or being carried off into this water. That could be arsenic, mercury, or lead, or cadmium, or any other heavy metal. And again, it can leach from any of those sources. In terms of atmospheric pollution, the big one is carbon dioxide because that is a greenhouse gas and is the major contributor to climate change. But we're also making carbon monoxide and the other big one, which is sulfur dioxide. Um, again, a lot of coal is associated with um, sulfur containing rocks and there's a lot of sulfur impurities in coal. And when we burn coal, it creates sulfur dioxide, which in the atmosphere creates the secondary pollutant of sulfuric acid because it reacts with water uh, vapor in the atmosphere making sulfuric acid that can then rain out or be um, deposited out either through wet deposition or dry deposition. And that's what we're seeing up in this gra um, graph on the top right, where we are seeing um, air pollution leading to acid rain and the um, acid rain itself. So if we have um, a lot of coal burning power plants, let's say in the industrial areas of the East Coast, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, where there's a lot of industry, we have the potential for a lot of acid rain, especially with our lower grades of coal, like lignite and bituminous coal, because they have more impurities. Coal is notorious for releasing a lot of particulate matter or soot. Um, soot, you should know, is also called black carbon. Sorry, forgive my handwriting. I'm trying to write with my mouse because I don't have my pen today. Um, so black carbon, and that a lot of those particles are fine enough to get into the airways, get lodged in the lungs, and lead to um, lead to respiratory problems, including cancers, like we talked about with uh, with biomass, with wood, um, burning wood. And then we have all the heavy metals. So, for example, um, 
42% of the atmospheric mercury of, in the US is from coal combustion. So we have lots of heavy metals that can go into the atmosphere by burning coal as well. Now, I don't want you guys to come away with this thinking that um, every time that you burn coal, you're going to be releasing all of these things because we do have some devices that they install on power plants that remove um, many of the other impurities besides carbon dioxide, even carbon dioxide. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we could be putting bag filters on to reduce the particulate matter that gets released. We could be putting um, wet scrubbers on that releases the sulfur dioxide or that minimizes the sulfur dioxide that's being released. So we do have some things that can minimize the pollutants that are being released. Now those um, things we'll talk about later on in our atmospheric pollutants unit, so don't worry about them here. Um, but the other thing that I want to mention is that they're typically going to be used in developed countries where regulations are stricter and um, often more enforced rather than in developing countries where regulations are typically more lax. Um, the regulatory bodies, the government is trying to catch up to the industrialization and um, where enforcement doesn't always happen. Now we can also capture carbon dioxide. So carbon capture technology does exist. It is expensive um, and uh, it's starting to be used worldwide, but um, not being used that often or that much. Uh, we'll talk about it later on as well. The last thing that I want you to leave with is um, human health effects. So we've talked about this a little bit, so I'm not going to really go into it too much detail. But what I do want to note is that um, your coal is going to be the most dangerous um, fuel source that we have. That's primarily due to respiratory problems of people living downwind of the power plants. That's due to the particulate matter and the acid deposition, but it's also due to um, to effects of the miners. So black lung disease is notorious among coal miners, right? People that breathe in, or people that are mining coal, especially subsurface miners are going to be inhaling small little uh, particles of coal dust all the time, even with uh, proper respiratory, um, proper respiratory personal protective uh, gear. And these uh, small pieces of coal dust get lodged in the lungs where they never leave and um, contributes to this black lung disease. So coal is definitely the um, the most deadly of all the energy sources. It's one of the ones that we use the most, so it is contributing to lots of deaths worldwide every year. Um, brown coal, lignite is going to be the worst, and then your bituminous and anthracitic coals because brown coal has the most impurities and burns the dirtiest, meaning that it has the most particulate matter, the most soot, the most black carbon, etc. All right, I'll leave you guys with that. Um, you can go through the learning objectives on your own, but this video is getting a little bit long as it is, so I'll see you all in class. Bye.